Hi, and welcome to the Fief Pro Podcast, Changing the Game. I'm Allie Riley. In this series, we'll be speaking to international female footballers about their personal journeys to success and find out what it's taken for them to reach the top of their game. And in celebration of the 30th anniversary of the FIFA Women's World Cup, we'll also be looking at how women's football has evolved over the last three decades and discuss what more needs to be done to protect the well-being of players and ensure that future generations can reach their full potential. Today, I'm talking with Pia Sundhage. To be professional for me is actually have a chance to put all the energy and focus on something you really can do well. And I think that is one of the reasons why the women's game is so much better today. Pia's had an incredible career as both a player and a coach. She first represented Sweden aged just 15 and gained 146 caps and 71 goals for her country before retiring as a player in 1996 and moving into full-time coaching. In her role as head coach, she led the United States women's national team to two Olympic gold medals and a silver medal in the 2011 World Cup. A year later, she was named as FIFA Head Coach of the Year. Pia is currently head coach for the Brazil women's national football team. In this episode, we'll be looking back at the Women's World Cup of 1995. Pia, what an honor. Thank you for being on the FIFA Pro podcast with me. Well, thank you for having me. I'm honored, too, to talk to you, a football player. I love that. <laughs> well, we've crossed paths many times, but the era that we are going to go back to right now is a little bit before my time as a player, and that is the summer of 1995. After finishing third with Sweden in 91, how were you and your Swedish teammates feeling heading into the second ever FIFA Women's World Cup? We were so excited. First of all, the very first in China, 91. And when we could host the, the, the World Cup 95, I am 35 at the time. And that is very old back in the good old days. Today's not old, but back then. And I remember I was so happy, the fact that I continue to play this beautiful game and the fact that the World Cup is coming to Sweden. Do you have any specific memories from the tournament or the Swedish crowds? What was the support like? I remember the very first game against Brazil, a big crowd in south of Sweden. And, um, of course, everybody was excited. But I also remember, you know, being 35 and uh, we lost the first game and I didn't play well. That was really hard because I've been coaching elderly players after that. And it's not that it's the end of the world if you make a mistake. It's so different when you're 25. And I was 35 and I remember the Brazilians, they won 1-0 and ooh, that was not good. However, uh, the second game is against Germany. Everybody was talking, and Germany is such a good team, but uh, we won that game, and uh, then we advanced later on. But um, fans, uh, it was very unusual for us. You know, when we played the European Championship and in, in, in back at home, yeah, uh, you had the fans once a year, maybe, and uh, you have a lot of journalists coming up and asking what's going on and, and wanted to learn about the players. And some of the journalists, they didn't know uh, a lot about the players like they do today. Well, so I have to ask, going off of what you mentioned about when a player doesn't have a good game, and it's funny you're saying, you know, back then 35 was old. I'm getting those comments as a 33-year-old already, everyone asking, how, how much longer are you going to do this? And I'm like, as long as I can. But now that you're a coach, what's the way that you approach talking to a player, especially when it's the first game of a tournament? Nothing is lost. Nothing is over yet. How do you approach a player that you know can perform better and you need them to be able to have that kind of goldfish memory, as Ted Lasso likes to say? I remember at 2008, actually, Olympics with the U.S. team and Kate McGrath. She's been playing previously the, when they won 2004. And in that pregame talk, uh, she was actually, I wanted to involve the players, and she was saying, you know what, it's okay to make a mistake it's because you have to enjoy the moment. Otherwise, uh, for me especially, it's not worthwhile to play these big games if you can't enjoy it. So she was saying that, and <laughs> believe it or not, against Norway, we lost 2-0, and she made a huge <laughs> mistake. 
So after that game, and then again, you have to have some actions behind those words. So uh, because it's all about trust, all about trust, relationship, and to be specific with certain things. Yeah, she made a huge mistake, but I think she played well in the game. So bringing out the best in that game and just tell her, you know, we need to do this more. What, what do you need in this specific situation and bring up the positive things? And, um, well, ended up to play the final against Brazil and winning an extra time and Carly Lloyd scored the goal, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so it, it was, it's a, a great story. But it, it started with Kate made a, a huge mistake. Yeah, I remember that tournament well. I think everyone got a little confidence booster after playing New Zealand too, unfortunately. (laughs) (laughs) Well, let's take it back a little bit further. I've read that when you were growing up, you, in order to play in in a league, girls weren't allowed to play. So your coach told you to pretend that you were Pelle and, and pretend to be a boy to play. How long was that going on? When were you actually allowed to be Pia and play as a girl with boys or with other girls? As far as I remember, my mother told me that my name was Pelle, which is a boy's name instead of Pia. But I called myself Pelle actually back then, uh, which is pretty cool when I'm in this country. Uh, anyways, so because after the games, it went, uh, I always played with the boys. And, um, but after, I think it was after, my mother said, after two years, somebody found it out that I was a girl and then I couldn't play. After two years? Yes. So I was uh, fooling around in backyards and playing that big ball, you know, all the time instead of tossing a small ball like the girls always did. So, and I was lucky because we uh, we moved to another little village and I changed school. So uh, then I got a chance to play in the women's uh, team. I was 11 at the time and the oldest one was 32 something. And uh, it was just crazy, but it didn't matter because I got a chance to play real goals, a real referee and 11 versus 11. And for me, that was the paradise. So I've been playing as a Pelle and then I became Pia and I got a chance to play in uh, Ulri Saham, it's called. And uh, thanks to uh, teachers, not mom and dad, they said, yeah, well, if you're happy, just play but they were not into football. It was actually a great society. People take care of, of each other. You have neighbors. And this time it was a teacher telling me, you know what, they, I can tell you play with the boys. So uh, there is a girls team or a women's team over there. So that's, um, that's how I ended up in EFK Ulrisa Ham and play the women's game. Well, I hear so many successful stories of girls who are playing with boys. And I mean, on the one hand, you can really understand how having that experience at a young age, the technical ability, the speed, there are good things. But of course, you're so happy now that there are all these opportunities for young girls to have female role models. Do you think that there is a benefit with growing up and be able to play with boys that the top players maybe are still playing with boys? Or should we really be encouraging players to be playing with other girls and obviously we want the opportunity to be there but I don't know maybe it's kind of an interesting question well if you look at the game itself uh, I usually say coaching the, the the youth national team in Sweden for instance if you're challenged so I, I really like to compete and as a as a girl I was competing all the time and it all depends on which level so boys or girls I don't think it matters actually it's about the level you want to be where you, um, if you really want to improve your game and you want to spend so much time on the pitch, just do it. It doesn't matter if you're girls or boys you're playing with. At the same time, I know there are many teams in Sweden, for instance, and on the beaches here, for you know, in Rio, they just play maybe twice a week or something like that. Because for me, football is it's like the society. Some of uh, the players, they are really good and they really want to keep, they have this strength and so on. But some of them, they just hang around and that's perfectly fine. So um, to answer your question, I think you could do a little bit of both. You just ask yourself, what do you think is fun? What will actually challenge you? And sometimes it could be boys and sometimes girls, of course. Uh, But also it depends on the country. So... 
you know, if you don't have many girls playing, you can't even get a team. Why end that? No, I couldn't. No, just play and play whoever wants to play with you. So don't make it so complicated. Just uh, come together and two goals and attacking, defending. That's it. Yeah, absolutely. So when you did return to Sweden now as a coach of the national team instead of a player, what differences did you notice in terms of maybe media support now players are fully professional compared to when you were playing and had to have a job on the side? It's a really big difference. Uh, first of all, uh, back in those days, we have some journalists. They, they hardly knew the names. And in the very, very beginning, they actually sent it uh, women journalist. Well, I don't know why, but uh, that was not a good idea because it, she didn't know anything about football. Today, I think it's such a great time when you can tell all the stories. Every single game has a story. And, um, uh, you know, with professional players as well. Uh, when I actually was um, preparing for the World Cup 91, I was working for the Swedish Federation. But um, uh, I had to practice early in the morning before I start work. And then when work was done, I went back and I had my second practice. Uh, to be professional for me is to actually have a chance to put all the energy and, and uh, focus on something you really can do well. And I think that is one of the reasons why the women's game is so much better today. So during your playing career, when you were having to train and have a job on the side what did your day today look like and how draining was that for you to plan everything and try to get all that training in while still trying to support yourself uh you know i work for the swedish federation and i remember when i went to a job with my cleats in my hand and i was out from the job because i'm going to a pitch because i had to uh train seven o'clock in the morning meanwhile my uh, co-workers they went into the job and they start to work but that was my way to um, it's so important to organize the day because I, I really wanted to improve my game and then after work I was rushing out and went to my club Hamabi and it went on the whole week and then we have games in, in, in the weekends of course it was interesting with food <laughs> because I need to eat so much more than anybody else. And I was never hungry. That's what's the problem. And I also have to organize the day uh, and, and find out what's the best way to, uh, you know, to have all these practices I really wanted because that was individual practice in the morning for me, myself. I didn't have any coach. I come up with this idea on my own uh, because I wanted to, uh, to improve uh, my first touch or whatever it was. Sometimes I think about how the professional players uh, in some countries, how their life are. Uh, it, it's a very different from mine um, because it was about hours, minutes. And uh, to be honest, well, this is how to be a, a professional player. Uh, and that's uh, then you have to organize your day. And it, it's one thing. It won't come easy to you. Wow, that's good. Because then, uh, it, well, this is professional if it won't come easy to you. It's like Abby told me, well, if everybody's going to win the, the gold medal, that's not a big deal. So it has to be difficult. She said it's a privilege to play under pressure. And I learned something, uh, especially uh, going to the, the World Cup 95. I thought that everybody was training a lot. And I was thinking, okay, everybody's training a lot. Me too. So... How would that differ from other players? Yeah, it's the mental part. What I'm thinking, what I'm doing, this is my way. And I'm the only one to take just my journey. And then you don't think about um, it's 7 o'clock in the morning. It's snowing sometimes. No, this is my way. And I felt I made me strong. This is what I'm going to do. So did hosting the... 1995 World Cup in Sweden changed the mindset of people? Was there more interest in or support in the women's game post the World Cup? Not really, to be honest. It was a great summer. Uh, don't get me wrong. It was fantastic. But uh, to be honest, with all these tournaments, I've uh, been playing and then been coaching and so on. I think 
It's the only time it's in France, 2019, because after that something happened, and uh, I'm asking myself why. Probably because previously you had the traditional media covering the women's game. Now you have social media, and nobody can stop a woman with social media. You spread the world so much better than anybody else. So actually, I was thinking 2019, yeah, here comes the same old story. But I was wrong. I think that's interesting because I can see here in, in, um, in Brazil the same thing. You know, Instagram, uh, you know, all these kinds of uh, spread the word. It's so important. And I think that's beneficial for the women's game. And after 2019, something happened. Uh, 1995, no, not so much. Yeah, no, I definitely agree because with social media, I think so many people are telling us as women that we're not marketable, that no one cares what we think, what we wear, what we do. And social media has proved all of that wrong. And players were showing that little girls want to be them. Little boys want to be them. People want to wear what they're wearing. And all of a sudden the contracts are going up, the sponsorships are going up and it definitely felt different in 2019. Is there anything that you are surprised hasn't changed or not necessarily improved, but hasn't changed since the time when you were playing? Still there are people with an attitude of saying, well, football is nothing for women. But there's one thing that actually surprised me uh, a little bit. You know, we have taken so many steps. Uh, if you look uh, to be professional and, and um, you, know, you look at money, for instance, and getting paid and salary and so on. In some of the um, situations, you have people who decide, people with power to decide things. Still, there are a lot of men with old eyes. That surprised me that we haven't changed that yet. You know, also, one more thing. When you talk about equal pay, all of us, you know, you, you interview female players and they say so many good things. I'm really proud of every single football player, you know, uh, saying good things about the game and equal pay. I'm surprised that there are few men coming up and say, this is important. Because if you really think that uh, diversity, that equal pay, for instance, or whatever it comes to to be equal, if you think that makes the society better or, or the, the football or whatever, you have to step up. And it can't only be the women doing that. It has to be men. And I'm surprised that there are few of the men stepping up and saying, well, yeah, and you know what? This is crazy. You, we need to do something about it, and blah, 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 like that. So that surprised me a little bit. But mm, in, in 10 years from now, maybe something happens. Actually, it's funny you mentioned that because that's something that I think about all the time and talk to my teammates about. And I'm surprised that there aren't male players who at least want to take up the issue. I think they would look really great in terms of the support they would get from women around the world and probably a lot of organizations that support women. And what do you think is holding them back? Uh, I don't know. Um, if you say something about the game, and uh, you, you actually need to have a lot of courage, I think. We've had a lot of players saying good things, and, and, and I think um, that takes a lot of courage to do that. And um, we just need the first one and the second one, and then it goes. So, uh, But I think it would, ta it would take a while um, because that is different. Anything that is different very often seems to be very hard. That reminds me, when I was at Chelsea, I was lucky enough to meet David Luiz. And he was someone who was very outspoken in terms of supporting Come Watch the, the Women Play. He's one of the only players, I think, who's actually attended a women's game. I, it was a Champions League game. And I wonder, do you think, having seen, you know, Pelé, tweeting and, and writing about Marta, how big of a role do you think she's played in terms of that shift in mindset in Brazil? Because I get the sense that she has a lot of respect from everyone and it's not just limited to women. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, I've seen her play in Sweden a lot. She's, you know, started her career almost in Sweden, in Umeå. Uh, and she, a fantastic football player, still is. 
Uh, and I knew she's, she, she's famous, she's big, but <laughs> when I came here to Rio, now I understand how big she is. It's ridiculous. Uh, and she has been playing a very, very important part in this change of attitude in this country. And uh, as you said, Pelé, of all people, and uh, connected with Marta and, and so on. And uh, it is just fantastic. Uh, imagine how, as a role model, that is very important. And not only that, I've seen a couple of role models. She's one of them. Abby's one of them to uh, uh, follow closely. Or Lotta Gelli in Seger, uh, Megan Rapino, And, uh, you know, if I listen to the interview, in the very beginning when they interviewed me, uh, I felt that um, I was an uh, ambassador for the women's game. I couldn't be personal or private because all my answers was the, the women's football's answer. Now it's changed a little bit because you have more voices. So uh, I think you don't have to represent uh, women's game in the whole world or not even women's game in Sweden or in, in, in Brazil. Because now we have more voices, and uh, Marta is a, a fantastic voice. It's it's hard to imagine how big she is, um, and she's been over time as well. The best player uh, scoring goals is pretty nice, and she scored the last time uh, with me. So uh, it's it is very important to have role models, and I think all the women I've seen. Uh, talking about the game has been very good role models. I really appreciate that. I'm grateful that I, I could be part of this because back in the good old days, we didn't have anything. And now we have many role models and, and great voices to spread the word. Well, speaking of voices, having played with Marta in the U.S., this is the second time, and in Sweden, you know, there's a lot of singing going on, a lot of music, you know, all hours of the night. And I think that's something that you two share in common. And it just felt like kind of a match made in heaven when you were headed over to the Brazilian national team. And of course, we got to see it in full force in Japan. There was Danny Alves, Marta, you're jamming in the elevator playing piano. And I think we all know having followed your career and myself being close with the Swedish players and the US players that music has played a large role in your role as a coach, but how long has that been going on and, and why music and when did this start with the, you know, your guitar and the singing and were you also like that as a player and also, you know, how has that really kind of culminated now being in Brazil where, you know, music, football, it's life? Well, just to ask one of my teammates, oh, she's bringing that guitar again all the time, <laughs> you know, we go from, uh, from one place to another and you know, I, I just uh, just like to play the guitar. So that's one way to, uh, you know, connect with people, but also to uh, enjoy life pretty much. Because for me, it's funny, when it comes to uh, football, I compete all the time. I love compete on the highest level since, uh, since I was 15 years old and playing my first game for Sweden. But when it comes to music... I'm not competing. I'm just enjoying. So if somebody enjoys me, it's even better. And um, music, I try to learn the language by singing Portuguese nowadays. Not easy. Muito difícil. Wow. And I had a fantastic experience in, in the Olympics when it comes to music because Marta and I went to a press conference. And uh, it was a long way to go. And she was singing and playing. And I'm thinking, what is this? And she had the, the one song after another. And uh, I didn't understand a word, but I did understand the rhythm. And the way she is around people, it, uh, she, well, she's contagious in some, some sort. And, uh, of course, as you know, football is feelings. Uh, and um, uh, music is feeling as well. So I remember when I was a player, I listened to specific music. I think many plays do that uh, to put me in a certain f um, moment. And, uh, you know, this is what uh, works for me. And um, in the national team, before we go uh, to a game, we have a little bit of a video. We talk a little about uh, to put ourselves in a certain mood, so to speak. And uh, great pictures, 
great uh, music, whatever that is, because they don't like Bob Dylan here. So, <laughs> so I'm a little bit in trouble. But uh, yeah, I, I need to chase that a little bit. But um, music plays a very important part in, in many lives, I think, and, and especially in my life. So my first furniture when I went to U.S. was a guitar. My first furniture here in Rio was a guitar. I think it's cool seeing teams that play music and listen together because, of course, it's a cultural thing. But like you're mentioning, a lot of us, we go, we have our headphones on. You have that specific music that you like, you know, and everyone's in the locker room all in their own world. But it is a beautiful sight to see, I think, when a team is able to embrace it together and the rhythm and the songs. And I, I'm just like... How do they know all these songs, all the words and the dance moves too? the dance moves? They have these coordinated dance moves. So I'll be waiting to see dance moves um, from you next. <laughs> oh, they're crazy. That's true. Footwork. Great. So I remember the first time I had met you was when you were coaching China. So from going to China, the U.S., Sweden, also club teams in Sweden, and now Brazil, how much are you putting your philosophy and your background and your culture onto a team and how much is it adapting to the culture that's already in place when you're going from, you know, very different parts of the world and different cultures? Uh, well, that's a very interesting question. I ask myself uh, a day like this, for instance, um, uh, of course, I'm not the same coach as I was in, in uh, China or for that matter in the U.S., and there for two reasons. You have the culture, expectations, but also I'm getting older. So uh, back then uh, in the U.S., I knew that they've been winning quite a bit. Here, I think it's 10 years since uh, they won anything. So that's, there's certain things, facts. I'm, I'm really, uh, I think it's important to find out uh, the expectations and uh, realistic uh, goals as well. But I do have my philosophy. When I do some presentation at times, I always, always say two things. One thing is the gold medal. Uh, football is so much more than the gold medal. And I hope my coaching style shows that. And the other thing is I'm never alone as a coach. Uh, alone, I'm, I'm useless, honestly. But together with other coaches, the staff, I could be my very best. All my life, I've taken notes. You should look at my diary. Oh, my mommy. You probably sell that for a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the thing is, I actually underline this is, as a player, how I felt when that coach said this or did this. or And I and had a, a long essay writing my things. And um, there's uh, uh, two coaches, actually, in the national team. is Ulf Lyfors and Bengt Simonsson, those two, they included me in a football chat. It was not that very usual, uh, you know, back then, but I could sit with the coaches, actually, with the staff. And back then, we didn't have many staff members either. But I think it was so important for me to listen to how they talk about football. I'm playing, but I heard their voices. So um, that's one thing. I want to include the players as much as possible. What do you think the women's game needs in order to take the next step, to get to the next level in terms of maybe investment or engagement or quality? It dawned on me the fact that in the whole world, we don't have many professional players. You hear me talk about competition and uh, all these tournaments, so important like European Championship and uh, and now we, we have, you compete as a club team and as a national team and so on. So that is one thing. If we have more players that actually were professional. So if I look in this country, yeah, to some extent they are professional. It depends how you define to be professional to begin with. So if you make it more professional, you will have better fields, better coaches in general. I mean. Because if you compete, we will change the game. I think there are uh, one thing that is bothering me a little bit. Uh, it is uh, the technique. The speed of play is getting better and better, uh, but it's a little bit embarrassing when the ball is flying out of the pitch. 
And if I be more specifically, if you look, the runs in the box and the ball played into the box with an angle, mm, it could be so much better. So the defending is pretty good nowadays. What, what we need to do is to improve the next step speed of play. Uh, that means reading the game, the final pass in the box, to be more specific. But um, uh, it comes down to compete. If you compete and if you think it's important, then you get good coaches, you get good pitches, and so on. Yeah, that's certainly a hot topic in the NWSL right now in terms of professionalism and and we have a campaign with our association for no more side hustles and i think from player salaries kind of a minimum global standard everything you're mentioning from fields to coaches to refereeing i definitely agree and while i hope those things would all be improved by 2023 my final question is what do you think the legacy of the 2023 women's world cup will be many teams and many teams, the fact that there are many good teams in the world, many women playing and competing and it's getting better and better. So I think that is just a, a, a great new start of, uh, you know, if I say I love football, it doesn't matter if the men or women. And the, the World Cup, we show that it's very entertaining and it's very exciting. And... Um, for people, if you want excitement, it doesn't matter if you're men or women. And I really hope that will be a success with many teams and uh, in your country and in the Australia. So uh, congratulations. I think that will be a blast. I think so too. Well, thank you so much. It's honestly been an honor. I, I've learned so much. I'm about to go out and practice my angled balls into the box. <laughs> Great. But no, sincerely, thank you for being on the podcast, Pia. Thank you for having me. Thanks. That's all for this episode of the Fief Pro Podcast, Changing the Game. If you've enjoyed this episode, please do like, subscribe, and review it, or maybe share it with a friend. Thanks for listening and I'll see you next time.